Good afternoon everyone, welcome along to, uh, to my home. For those of you here for the first time, uh, it's great that you uh, could come. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, presenters this afternoon. We've got Corny who's come over from Western Australia uh, and he's going to be uh, answering questions and talking to you about uh, his life and uh, some of the things that he's realised. It, it's quite astounding. And uh, I'd also like to introduce you to uh, AJ, who's uh, given his time, and uh, he lives three hours from here, and he's come to do this talk uh, this afternoon. There's a box outside uh, for donations, and I would encourage you to uh, be generous, um, because it's done for free, and uh, we want it to continue. So let's, let's give uh, Courtney and AJ a really enthusiastic uh, Udlow welcome. Real crazy. <laughs> well, after today, you might not feel like doing that. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, because today I've got uh, a session that I'm even afraid to present. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is just hand out, there's four pages here for everyone. Uh, two, two pages, actually. Two pages printed double side. So if you can just take the top two and then pass them on. And we'll do the same at the back. A lot of new faces today, welcome, and uh, I just wanted to thank to, I wanted to give a special thanks to Fraser for doing the videoing for us today, and um, his videos turn out with really nice quality, you can even see the whiskers on my face, and, it's, <laughs> and that worries me a lot, so I just uh, have to acknowledge that, um, and I'd like to thank Peter too for his effort organising today. Um, he had some stuff on this morning and it required a bit of uh, manipulation of his timing to, to, to make sure everything worked. And uh, so I'd like to thank him too for his time today. How's everyone going with those sheets? Oh, somebody needs to give me one. <laughs> thank you. I need one. <laughs> Any spares? Peter. How many did you bring? I bought 120. Most of you would know this is going to be my last session for six to eight weeks. And uh, after we go through today, you'll probably understand why it'll be my last session for six to eight weeks. Because <laughs> I've got some fairly uh, deep emotions that have come up for me over the last week or two, and I feel like I need to get some alone time to deal with those emotions. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of uh, hiking by myself and things like that, and just going off into the wilderness, <laughs> and uh, doing a bit of my own emotional work so that I can get over these emotions. But one, one thing I would like to do though is invite Cornelius up with me as well. So if Corny can join me. What I would like to do first, there are some of you that it's the first time that you're here and have all of you watched the DVDs, those introductory DVDs? Very good. Now, um, Cornelius is one of the 14 uh, that I've mentioned in those DVDs. And uh, it's probably, for many of you, the first time you've met another one of the 14. So what, what I would like to do is just introduce him to you. <laughs> and uh, he's been a friend of mine for a long time, a couple of thousand years. <laughs> and, uh, and I just feel that it would be very, very good for you to get to know him a bit too. And so any of your questions that you want to ask today, Please feel free to ask myself or Corny questions 
Uh, by the way, Corny is the shortened form of Cornelius. For those of you. <laughs> Corny, Corny's real name, by the way, is David Walsh. Uh, he comes from Western Australia. He lives there at the moment, but was born in Melbourne. Melbourne yeah. mm. But uh, I've always felt him to be Cornelius from the moment I've met him. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that'll give you a chance to just uh, understand a little too of what it's like for different ones of the 14 going through the processes they're going through of, realisa of realisation of who they are. All right, so what we want to do first is we're going to just uh, have a sort of quiet fireside chat. We'll try and be loud enough with our voices so that we can carry to the end there. And you can ask any questions that you want. So feel free to do that today. And then what we're going to do is have a break. And afterwards I'll do a presentation of some fairly confronting material for you to have a look at in your own lives. And uh, you'll notice in the handouts that I've given you today that there's some swear words in them. <laughs> which, is, which is a first, isn't it? I think. Um, so, those who, of you who feel like you're offended with that, um, I'm not sorry, actually. <laughs> um, and what I would like to do today a bit is to help you see what emotions are truly within yourself, rather than just glossing over these kinds of emotions, and help you also go through the process of being able to connect with them in, in, a, in a very rapid way, if you want to. So that's what I was trying, what, what I wanted to present today. All right, so for those of you who are new, this is your opportunity to ask questions, ask away. Can um, we sit down? Yeah. Far away. Um, I'm, I don't know if this is going to be part of your lecture, but I'm really interested in the soul from the perspective that I'm a half of another soul. Yep. And when, well, I don't, I, I feel I've never met my soulmate. So, how, A, I would like to know how that we would recognise that when we met it, or him, her, I don't know how quite how to phrase it. Mm -hmm. And then also, is the soulmate relationship always going to be an intimate one? Or is it also possible that it's just a deep friendship because you did imply that there was the masculine and the masculine and the feminine and the feminine. And to be nourished in intimate relationship, does that need to be our soulmate? So well, I've answered most of those questions in previous discussions. Uh, there was a discussion about a month ago in Brisbane called The Human Soul that answered most of those questions. So my suggestion would be to have a look at that video. It should be, I think it's published now, isn't it, Peter? Yeah, on the table. On the, I on the table. Um, it's called? Just, I called it the human soul. Yes. Yep. And we discussed the whole separation there and what's going on and, and, and soulmate attraction, what it's really about. So uh, rather than answer those questions again for the people who have already heard those answers, my suggestion would be to have a look at that video. I'm just interested uh, <clears throat> what your approach in this slide to the Eucharist service. Um, the Eucharist service? In other words, the, uh, the religious practice of celebrating my blood and, and flesh. Um, I don't agree with it at all um, and never have agreed with it even in the spirit world. Um, it's, it was something that was instituted after my death and it wasn't instituted by me, as was claimed. And uh, it focuses far too much on myself and my life, rather than what is on the real, real saving of the soul, which is to do with God's love entering the soul. And so um, further gospel revisionists modified these things to line them up with the Pauline philosophies from the, what, what would be called the Old Testament of the Bible, trying to marry up why the Israelites had sacrifices or blood sacrifices for sin. And then it was then attributed that I was then the saviour of man's sin. And that obviously is not correct either. As you will find, any of you will find as soon as you pass, that any sins that you have not paid for at the time of your passing, you will still be paying for when you've passed. So 
Um, so all of those teachings are not based on truth, and they weren't teachings that I taught in the first century either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of dealing with a little bit of commitment at the moment, because um, uh, in my world I have many ideas of reincarnation, like somebody has said that you're over lighted with Jesus, you're not actually reincarnation of Jesus. And um, I've defended you, I've not defended you, I've gone, oh my goodness, where do I stand? <laughs> like, what should I, do I, uh, as you can remember, you can already feel my confusion. So, in, um, do I have to make up my mind and follow you, follow that person, or oh, I can't see you because you told me la la la, mm -hmm. or can I just go there? Like it's worrying me that if I'm not committed to one thing that I feel really, I'd like from the word, the word go that I met you, I felt, you know, a real connection and everything you said has resonated with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm worrying in my own world that if I can't commit to that, what am I putting out in my law of attraction? that I'll get back. Will I just get masses of confusion <coughs> back and non-commitment? No, I'm serious. No, that's very, I mean, like, it's very true. This is um, a big thing for me because so many people, and they deal in past lives, and I've believed <coughs> I've had many past life healings and all this sort of thing, and now yeah. you're giving a different, and whatever you say too feels really right as well. Yeah. So I am impressed with this confusion. And um, once I, after the six week sabbatical that I've taken, <laughs> Um, I will be doing a discussion on reincarnation as a whole discussion um, because a, a lot of people are asking a lot of questions about reincarnation and why. And, um, my suggestion though is that on the CDs that you've already been given, for those of you who have received those, those that aren't, haven't received, I think there are some here, aren't they Peter? Yeah, on the table. Um, yeah, there's, the table. there's some at the table. Um, on that CD there is a 100 page document that I've written about reincarnation. And my suggestion is to read that document and that will help you go through a lot of what's actually occurring with regards to spirit interaction. Most people's belief in reincarnation revolve around spirit interaction, what, what they don't understand about spirit interaction. And so I find the majority of people don't want to come and see me again after they hear the truth about reincarnation. And so um, I understand their feelings and their viewpoint. My suggestion is that reincarnation is not a major issue. It's nowhere near as major as what many people are making it to be. Because in the end, your soul can progress no matter what condition you're in, where, no matter where you are. So, so when a person passes into the spirit world, one of the things, if you're a medium, you would know, is that spirits do progress in the spirit world. right? So if that's the case, then it's obvious that you don't have to return to earth to progress. So the whole viewpoint of reincarnation from a point of view of having to come back to Earth to progress spiritually is incorrect. But let's address your emotion. Your emotion is one of confusion and you are getting that reflected back on you. And the key for you now is just to ask, to, to now search for the truth on that subject inside of yourself. So my suggestion is to read the pageant messages on the subject, read the the document that I've written on the subject and then let that resonate or not resonate with you depending on how you're feeling at the time. You will find all the way through your progression, and this applies to all of you, that you'll read something today and not understand it at all or perhaps disagree with it totally and then in six months time after you've dealt with a whole group of emotions you'll find you'll be able to go back and read that same material and think totally differently, even perhaps totally the opposite way as to what you thought six months earlier. So my suggestion is to not judge any of your current feelings about the matter so much, but just keep focusing on your emotional progression, on your soul progression. Focus on that, and as you focus on that, and if you stay in truth with that, all of these other truths, the truth about reincarnation, the truth about you know natural love, and the truth about the moral laws, and all those other things, they will all come to you and you'll realise them in your heart. So, so do that first, go through that process first. But you were right, when you are in a state of confusion, you will get lots of people around you reflecting your confusion back to you. And that is your law of attraction. And it's there to, to show you, hang a sec, you're in a state of confusion, 
and you need to work your way through that issue emotionally, not intellectually. So it's not about studying more, it's about feeling confused, letting yourself feel confused. Let yourself go into that emotion. Who do I trust? You know, go into that emotion, because that's the emotion that's being exposed. So many of you feel attracted to what I'm saying to you at the soul level, but you also feel that you can't trust me 100%, right? And that's, that's, that's the trust issue coming up for you. Yep. I think it's very helpful, um, because what was the, question? Uh, the question was, um, is it helpful to think that your soul is perfect, um, particularly when, it, when you're first incarnated? And yes, I think it's very helpful to understand that all of us have been created perfectly, and when we first incarnated, we were in a pristine state. Because then we don't identify ourselves and our personality with our errors. See, many of you at the moment through your emotional processing are having a problem by that you are now identifying yourself as the error and you feel so ashamed of yourself as a result. And then you don't allow yourself to feel the emotion, right? So let's say you had a feeling inside of you of rage, so much rage that there's some people that you actually feel you'd like to kill. <coughs> you actually feel that. You don't act on it, but you feel it. Now. If you identify yourself with that emotion, what's going to happen is you're going to start feeling yourself that, that that's you. And then you'll be ashamed of yourself for having that feeling. And what do you generally do when you're so ashamed? You generally don't allow yourself to process that emotion. Does that make sense? And, and so it can be a great impediment to you thinking that this emotion is really you. The truth is that every emotion that's in disharmony with natural love, and obviously murdering someone is in disharmony with natural love, every emotion in disharmony with natural love wasn't in you at the beginning. It got in you through this process of absorption of emotions from your family and your parents and from the surroundings and so forth. So those emotions in you do not define you. They are not you. They are... They are mud being splattered at you that have your soul has now absorbed. And if you can see yourself as a pristine soul with all this mud and all the process that we're suggesting is to squirt off the mud. <laughs> right? which, is me which means I'm going to I'll be able to identify that mud, I'm going to be able to see it, I'll be able to feel it, and but the process of feeling it and experiencing it, will, it'll wash off of me. And that's the process that I need to allow myself to go through. So yes, it can be certainly very helpful for you to think of yourself as a pristine soul with a lot of mud that's been splattered at you. Yeah. So standing under the white light, light under a waterfall, cleansing your soul, and washing all the dark mud, wash away out of your feet. Um, you can go into a lot of these processes metaphysically, but they will not work. What you will need to do is go into them and experientially. In other words, you are going to have to feel every emotion that's mud inside of you as it passes through you. And that is the process of washing it out of you. So every time you try to do it a different way, you will find in the end that you're just fooling yourself in the end. Right? And, and so this is why a lot of people have been doing these things for years and years and years. And then when I talk to them for five minutes, they get angry with me. Well, why is the anger in them? Because they, all this process that they thought they had, that they thought worked, didn't actually work because their understanding of it was that they, could, they, they didn't have to feel it or experience it. So the truth is that you're going to have to experience every emotion that's mud in you. Right? <coughs> Oh, how many of you are a bit depressed about that one? <laughs> right. 
But can you see that it's a part, it's a part of you, it's become a part of you, it's all locked up in you. How else is it going to come out? Now you can tap your way out of it or you can do all sorts of other techniques way out of it, but you're not going to get out of it until you experience it. Then you will get out of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, AJ, on your human level, yep. and, um, and your soul level, at times I imagine it might be in conflict in, in relation to your own emotional growth, and your own emotional blocks, or life, or things that you're dealing with through your life. Yep. When, when these sessions that are happening, in connection to where you're sitting and getting at, how, do you ever go away and wonder whether anything that's come to you from the group has triggered anything that you might be struggling with? The groups trigger me constantly. Because right. you've got you've got a hundred or two hundred people projecting all sorts of emotions at you. So how, how, how do you manage that? Like what, what do you what do you do on a practical level? I don't manage it. Okay. I just I just go into it. Like so so at the moment I can feel like there's probably a third of you are sort of in the lines of, yeah, I reckon he might be Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Three quarters, you know, the other two thirds, or just a, just a bit under two thirds, are, oh, I don't know about this. You know, like there's a lot of those kind of emotions coming, and later you'll find there'll be lots of emotions coming from you that I'll identify as we go through. And what I'm trying to do every single time is just allow myself to feel what's going on all the time. So that doesn't impact on any projection back from you. In any way, from an emotional block, you're able to clear it as you're going through to understand. No, no, it may trigger me now, and then I have to go home and maybe spend a whole week dealing with something. Okay. As a result, that's happened many times. Yeah. Like I've had groups where, you know, one half of the audience has just gotten up and walked out, okay. and and of course that has an effect on them, <laughs> right? Because if I've got emotions of unworthiness or whatever within me, they get triggered straight away. And then I have, I've had where people have got up and projected lots of anger at me, and like, and I, and I go home confused because I'm saying, I just did a free session, and they're angry with me. Like, how can you be angry with someone who just give you something for free? <laughs> you know, so I'd go home and process that emotion, you know, and feel all those emotions as they're coming up. So the the key thing is to allow yourself to feel everything you're feeling at the time you're feeling it, that's the most powerful thing. Yeah. But not always easy. I was wondering if Cornelius could share some of his experience with, like, since starting on the divine love path and processing your emotions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm an expert at it, but um, where do you want to start? Like, oh, just from like where you were beforehand and what state you were in and then as you've been you know, processing your emotions, what's been do you mean like identity wise or just in general? Yeah, just just like in general, like what you've kind of noticed and all through my life, just generally just done that sort of thing anyway, really. Just sort of just felt things and just gone with them. I find now I'm starting to block down a bit more to stuff that I didn't understand. I'm starting to understand I don't want to see it now. <laughs> all first century stuff, just life's been quite good and everything hasn't been a hell of a lot, but there's a lot of stuff now I don't really want to go near if I have to. And do you find it hard to actually, in the beginning, to kind of get in touch with your emotions, or was it pretty, pretty easy for you in the beginning? Um, I don't think I thought about it much, I suppose, back then. I find it was just easy flowing more so. Sometimes I went like suppressed in big time. Um, actually needed some help at some stage, like I had to go and see a lady, just had a complete meltdown. That helped a lot, sort of like getting, I was actually so shut down, didn't even know what feeling it was. I didn't even know what words like, to describe what I was. I couldn't even describe those feelings, I didn't even have, was numb. So I had to relearn how to feel again. So it was kind of difficult, but um, it helped a lot. And just a, just a, such a shut down shell of, just all so I felt like a shell. There's just no life inside it. And I um, had to learn that way, I suppose, so like help, asking for some help, which I don't do often enough. <laughs> um, and even relationships, just learning things through relationships, like feedback from girlfriend might have been with at the time was just not the person that would help hold a girl's hand and, and tried it and just kept doing it and just trying that seeing how that felt and noticed how I just felt uncomfortable with love sort of at first I suppose and even other ones there's just lots of things but it still comes sort of 
it was natural, then it kind of blocked away, then it's sort of coming back a little bit more again. I don't know if that really answers your question, though. Is it getting easier, though, as you... Um, still, I still have trouble with the mind stuff, like, you can feel yourself blocking it down, shutting it down. I had trouble the other week, or just during the week, the stuff coming up, came up, and I kind of pushed it right down, because it really stopped. It was quite, really hard. And then started, um, sitting outside, just from, excuse me, <laughs> it's gonna happen. And doing some writing, I just started doing some writing with my left hand, just writing like questions to myself, like how do I feel about um, soulmate love, and there's a lot of anger come with that, and just kept writing stuff down with left hand, asking questions and answering with the right hand. Often times I'd answer and know that I wasn't truthful, I'm actually left handed correct myself. <laughs> and I'm asking the, what's the truth of your answer. Um, and that got down to just a big one of feeling just completely unloved, and then felt angry come up with that and hey Dad's got a boxing bag there so I just walked over to it and slipped the gloves on and just, just sat down and go and punch it. It's just every time I go and done that act released I've always hurt myself. <laughs> um, I could feel it coming up and feel like I've got to punch it now, I've got to punch it now. I could feel the anger coming up. I know that's the moment I have to get it when it's really strong. Otherwise I knew it was just gonna slide away and it did slide away. I punched a mozzie, he bit my foot, so I punched him. Um, I was disappointed that didn't happen, so I went inside and just had some music. I got an MP3 player, it just sort of seemed to trigger me, so just put that and that worked. That just kept on trying different things that were going to help to trigger it. Just trying to stay in it as much as you can when it comes up, because I try and walk away from it a lot of times. It's just the fear or the pain of what's going to come up, but just judging it by doing that anyway, rather than just trying to let it flow. It's like, it's like a relearning process when you're a kid. They just go and go nuts, and didn't matter where, right in front of everybody, like in the shopping centre, didn't care, you didn't care. But now we just judge ourselves every time something comes up, and we just shut it down straight away. And I felt myself doing that lately, and I've been trying to do the opposite now. As soon as it's coming up, just try and go with it now. Just trying to catch yourself in that moment. And when something falls up, you go, ooh, shut that down. You're just trying to go, no, let it go. And just trying to get more into the flow of just feeling naturally, and really learning how to do it when you're a kid. I feel it's like double the load. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still a soul, I'm still a person like you with injuries too, and I'm a front returning. You can understand that process a bit easier. I don't know if you do understand that. that yeah. One. yeah, it's just like. All the memories, all like there's all memories within your soul up at that stage, but reincarnating, you still have the memories, but there's no energy attached. You just work through all that, like no emotion attached to them, no negative stuff. So sort of it's just a memory. But as soon as you incarnate into your parents' body or the mum's body, it's also got dad's feelings as well. There, it's anything they've got is just going to be like energize whatever memory is there. Like there's lost heaps of loss of love for me in the first century, and so mum, after talking to her, I couldn't understand lots of stuff. I just didn't understand it because I didn't know anything about this. And I worked through lots of stuff and nothing was coming up. And um, but I even asked mum about that, about, <coughs> about loss of love, all of the feelings I was having. And I come to the truth about how I felt about my mother now, not about it, but how I felt as a kid. I just didn't feel loved. I was cared for beautifully and stuff and looked after her and everything like that. And even the memories I have about mum and dad's relationship, dad had come home as soon as he comes through the door and just give mum a big hug thing, do a kiss and we'd imitate him and stuff like that. And um, but I still didn't, I can't ever remember being hugged. I can't ever remember being like kind of nurtured. And um, I rang mum up and told her about that, just how I was feeling. And she was quite honest and she's good actually. She didn't bark back and say, oh, you were completely loved your whole life or anything. She's actually honest and said, that's. That's probably the same for her when she was a kid and it's just carried through. Just in a generation where she said, Oh, you were you'd be, be seen and not heard. And so she's kind of shut down. And she's been, I just realised the other day when she actually started doing some stuff in herself. And it's probably that time I had a meltdown. Mm -hmm. I, wonder, I just realised, I wonder if it's because she was doing that at that time too, it actually triggered stuff for me. Because the most loving thing a parent can do for their child is work on themselves. It's the most loving thing you could ever do. Yeah. Yeah. There's um. There's another one. There's this all that therapy stuff I was doing. It's kept on coming up. These feelings of being, like all the symptoms of being sexually abused. And I'm thinking, I remember most of my childhood and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, 
I don't get it. And I had to keep revisiting and revisiting it because it kept on like coming up. And I was attracting all the girlfriends of being sexually abused too. And I thought, what's going on there? Mm. And I thought, maybe it's something I don't want to entertain. So I'd entertain it again, like trying to go back into it. And I'm breathing up, so it's <laughs> pretty stuck up. Um, and then. Um, yeah, I just kept on pushing it away so I'm not understanding it when all this stuff came up about you know, the um, reincarnation thing, which I didn't want to take on at all. Starting to come up with some truth that happened in the first century as a kid. I was asking, I rang up mum and dad even, if I can ask them why they've been sexually abused because I had no idea what was going on. And stuff in the same as far as they know. I kind of shocked by the question. <coughs> But if you can imagine like 2,000 years of experiences, all them stuffed through a heap of emotions from your parents, rather than no experiences. So, so like in your first incarnation, what you're doing is you, you, you incarnate, and at that moment you just absorb the emotional experiences of your parents that they've unresolved, that they have to unresolve, and your environment. But if you've got 2,000 years of pre, his, pre that history, What's happening is that all of those experiences all get filtered through that uh, those emotions of your parents. So, so, so then, do you think we're going to have more or less to do with than yourself? Yeah. It only comes up when you want to allow. So I've tried both things: just try and denying everything, denying the identity and stuff like that, and that's made things more uncomfortable. I feel I feel probably more further away from myself, like more, less in touch. And then just trying the other way, try and see what happens when I just try and let that stuff happen and just come on. It's the same for yourselves, just if you just let it happen and see what happens. And it's really true when you start feeling that the hurt and stuff and when you go through it, it's the only time I really feel alive, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. So I feel real, I feel like me, you know, I'm starting to feel everything. So and that's and that's what your soul is really, it's just everything, it's all your feelings and everything. So I guess that's finding yourself. <laughs> but it is, it's beautiful in everybody when they're in truth and they, you know, they put this hard cover on trying to be, you know, be the man or you know, trying to be tough, trying to like be strong, what crap. You know, when they're just real, it's beautiful, isn't it, really? Can it be like an emotional um, there's a phrase, the, the layers of an onion, you know? Um, I've only just watched the DVD in the last week morning I was watching it and um, an emotion about my mother not feeling loved by my mother or receiving love from my mother came up through one of Natalie's um, channelings mm -hmm. and it reminded me of two days ago at work I was talking with another lady and I mentioned that my mother had passed two years ago and she said oh you must miss her a lot you must be very sad and I went no because I honestly didn't feel much when she passed over mm. because I felt as though I didn't have an emotional attachment to her because I didn't receive a lot of mm. love yeah. from her and I know that it wasn't her fault because she was brought up um, and the key is not go there don't yes, go there exactly, yeah. Yeah, but it, it was very strong it was um, very quick yeah. but I also um, said, now mum, we can fix this, yeah. because I know that I can help her move through, yeah. and she can also help me Certainly. move through. Certainly. But because it was so quick, and because I'm crying, I'll just answer my own question, it is a <laughs> layer effect, isn't it? Totally. It just keeps going until it's totally yeah. cleared, yeah. and then there's no... Emotion. Yeah, so at your mum's, at the time of your mum's death, you had hardly any emotion. And that was because you're so to that, that you were to totally shut down about this emotion of not being loved. But what's happening over the last two years, you're slowly opening up with that emotion. So now you'll actually go through a period where you don't, where you feel that you weren't loved, but you also have some positive feelings that you can have that healed as well. And obviously your mother in the spirit world can see can see your emotions better than what she could see them when she was alive. And so that, uh, that means that when you start working through these emotions, there's a good chance she'll be ready to work through why she didn't love you as well. 
and that will help you both quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. How? How far can we help others to recover from the pain and sickness? How far can I <coughs> help someone who is very near to me, it's my husband, <coughs> suffering on stroke? How far, what can I do for him? I do for myself. I am grateful for the tapes we got about three, four weeks. We are looking at them. They are beautiful. I get uh, get away from the fear of death. I am slowly working on to be alone, mm -hmm. to respect it. Mm -hmm. I am going through this. I, I have a feeling I melt a lot of my errors. Mm -hmm. I recognize them. I try to compare them with the truth. And then I cry also a lot all the time. Yep. He is in hospital. He should be here. Yep. And so the question my is how. Question is, I ask, that, excuse me, the divine love to go into his soul, enter the soil of him, and touch his soul and his heart with divine love's love, yeah. that he can recognize and build on that. Well, is that all I can do? Well, the truth is that we can't actually ask for divine love to enter another person. The reason why is because the divine love only enters a soul when the soul itself is open to receiving that love. But we can ask God a lot of other things to help the person open up to love. So, so when we pray for another person, the key is to direct our longings to, to help the person, for God to help the person in ever, whichever way is possible, to open their heart to God's love entering. And what God's constantly trying to do with all of his children is he's constantly trying to help the child get to a point where they will open their heart to love. And, and so the main way that we can help them is firstly, by our own example, opening up to love ourselves. But in terms of helping another, it's very, very difficult to help another if they do not want assistance. He's in doubt yeah. between yeah. yes and no. Yeah. And, and if a person's in that state, they must first move through that state emotionally and to, to get to the point where they really do want God's love to enter their heart. From that moment on, now they're getting lots of assistance, not only from yourself, but also from spirits and other, other people and the law of attraction. There's a lot of things that change. For many of you, you would have watched the... Those who watched the DVDs the first time in the last few weeks since Peter's seminar... How many of you had some emotional things happening within the week after watching it? Can you just indicate? So, quite a few, hey. But why was that? Because the DVDs had the effect of just opening your heart a little bit to some more truth inside of yourself. And as soon as that occurs, your heart now is wanting a connection with God. And as soon as your heart wants it, God gives you some of the divine love. And the divine love softens you up. Right? It turns your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. In other words, it softens you up so much that eventually you can feel more and more and more of your own emotion. And, and in fact, more and more and more of other people's emotion too. Um, so that's the process. Is to, you can certainly pray for others to be assisted, but, but they're not going to receive divine love until they personally have a longing for it. <coughs> but obviously if you're living in truth and you're living in love and you're doing all the things that you know and you're receiving divine love that's going to have a very powerful effect to everyone around you everyone around you is going to feel the change in you and everyone around you is going to be very much influenced by you does that make sense yes. yeah. so the key is to focus firstly on your own transition focus firstly on that and, and in that process, part of that will be praying for others to be open as well. But in the process of you opening, your soul will in fact trigger the opening of so many others as well in the process, just automatically. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for sharing, uh, Cornelius. Um, from what I hear you saying, there's a, quite a bit of experimentation involved in looking yeah. for those triggers. And I guess that's the goal, isn't it, to, to find those sensitive parts of ourselves. Mm. Um, 
I'm wondering, uh, I guess I, I see it like walking into a, like a beam, as it were. It's like, oh, you know, you get, get the light and it triggers something. Um, and what I guess I'm concerned about is where, what's the difference? Uh, it's like you could totally immerse yourself and wallow in that. Um, is it like you just go in enough just to trigger something and then be with what's triggered yeah. rather than just sort of... Um, keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Keep going, that's yeah. right, you've got to go. So it's like a little incremental, is it? Big pardon? Is it like you, you just go out in an incremental way? It's like the lady said about the onion. You can just go and skimmer a little layer if you want, but the onion's pretty thick. Yeah. <laughs> like you can just try and get through as many layers as you can, as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. and after a while, it's not scary as much. Mm. Like it's, you know, you've come through. I'm alive still. Mm. No, it's not as bad as I thought. And that was years ago. Like that was about 16 and through some stuff, and I'm still alive. So it can't be too bad. I, so I maybe have a bit more confidence <coughs> later on to experience more emotions, I suppose. It was a whole set that was shut down at the same time too. But um, and it's also like you heard the term God only gives you what you can handle, sort of thing. I think that's, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's your own, yeah. it's your own desire. Really. Yeah, it's kind of more about your own desire, where you would have, are you willing, you know, how much do you want this stuff out of yourself? How much mud do you want to spray off? It how happy do you want to be? But it seems like your willingness to jump into it, your capacity to do that seems to increase, have increased, is that right? Um, I suppose anything, like you, you do it over time, you get more confident at something, or you know the process, or you know what you're doing, you start to go, ah, oh, put yourself out there. Now you, know, you know what you're doing after a while, you become more self-aware of what's going on, emotionally. But the key is, yeah, go right into the emotion. But, but don't stay in capping emotions. What I mean, and we were talking about this more a little later, is a lot of us get into an emotion, like <coughs> say the emotion of, like, I hate women comes up, right? So, you know, with what women have done to me and all those kind of things, I finish up feeling this feeling of emotion inside of me of hating women. Let's say that's emotion is inside of me, and if I'm a woman, let's say it's that I hate men emotion, right? Is inside of me. If that emotion, if I stay in that emotion, rather than actually experiencing that emotion, I'll actually, I could actually do some very, very damaging things from that point onwards to, to women or men, right? The key, the key is to get into the emotion. So let's say the emotion is I hate women, and then get out boxing gloves or a bag or a, you know a bat and just go hell for leather just expressing that emotion to its full depth in a, in a, in a situation where you're not projecting the emotion on other people right? and just go for it and really really go for it and really get into it if you do that within a few minutes generally you'll get underneath that emotion and into the grief that that emotion covers you follow me? but if, if you don't fully express it you will seethe with it and when you seethe with it, you will not address the emotion. And on top of that, you will actually be projecting lots of damaging emotion to every single person around you, your own children. Every single person around you will be receiving those emotions because you're not owning them. The instant you own it will be the instant you choose to fully experience it and do it in a setting that, that, is, that is a safe setting. And, and so this is where, in the end, every setting will be a safe setting, right? Like, Somebody will, you know, you, somebody will trigger your I hate women emotion and you'll be able to just go outside and yell and scream and rant and rave and everyone will say, isn't it great? He's just connected with that emotion, right? <laughs> Nowadays what happens a lot though, when somebody goes outside and rants and raves and carries on about something, what do we all feel? <laughs> Heaps of judgment, don't we? And so therefore they shut down and they never get to the underlying grief. And, and so... The capping, we stay in the capping emotions often. So don't stay in those. Go into them and fully experience them. Really allow yourself to fully experience the capping emotion. So like this week I've had a lot of rage with, with God, you know, and so I'm out with a baseball bat, you know, swearing and screaming and banging, right? And, and I'll describe some of those emotions that I was feeling a bit late, a little later. And just go for it. And, and you find within a few minutes... Uh, all the emotion just rises in you and you, you go into the grief that that rage is covering. Yeah. So allow yourself to fully experience the emotion. Really get into the emotion. Go deeper and deeper and stay in it as long as possible. Because what will happen to, is that a lot of people feel that oh, you can stay in it for years. The truth is you can only stay in a capping emotion for years. 
the actual causal emotion is experienced just like you would have experienced it as a child. Right? And how does a child experience rage? They might rage for 10 minutes and then it's all out of them, isn't it? And then what are they in? Crying and sobbing. And that might go for, let's say, half an hour. And then that's all out of them as well. Do you follow me? This is what often happens to a child. But because we've shut all that down, all that processing down, what's happened now is we need to go through that same process of fully expressing the rage, fully expressing the grief, and really going into it. And stay in it, stay in it, until it's exhausted. And then when it's exhausted, you won't need to visit it again. If, if you didn't exhaust it, you will need to visit it again. So, so Jay's saying, use the law of attraction libraries that trigger a feeling, mm -hmm. go into it, and that, if you keep working into it, like some toxic things, then it might bring up the, the closest to the core emotion around yeah. what is actually the child. And you don't even need to use the law of attraction moments. If you know that this week you had three times where you were angry with men, for example, then you can actually, you, you can write that down right at that moment, even if you don't feel you can experience it, and just revisit those first thing, you know, Friday night, come home, all right, I'm going to deal with this anger as men. You don't need to wait for another law of attraction trigger to deal with it. Just put yourself back into those situations, get out, get out something that can express your rage, and fully <coughs> express the rage to such an extent that you're like a child expressing the rage. And when you get into that state, you'll find that very soon afterwards, you'll get into the underlying state. If you don't do that, what will happen is you'll stay in a seething state, in a simmering state. right? And when you stay in a simmering state, there are, there are people in the spirit world who have stayed in that state for tens of thousands of years, in a seething state. right? Where you're seething, but not actually experiencing the underlying emotion. So, I don't, I'm not suggesting doing that. Yeah. To the spirit, the spirit world, isn't it? I was talking to a spirit that was still affected, a couple of spirits still affected by my actions and about 2,000 years ago, still in that state. It's a long, long time. It's so sad that they have to be in that state. They don't have to be, but they choose to be. So they don't want to go further with what they grief. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back <coughs> to something you said in a release, there's a feeling of aliveness in it. Mm. I, I had an experience, so Ra and I were working through quite a lot of mental stuff and emotional stuff, and we were being quite expressive, but all of a sudden <coughs> I felt um, it was like an emotion that was there, it was organic, it was like a, this sort of shape thing inside me, and it only lasted for a few seconds, um, and then when I came back to... Brian, can I just stop you for a moment? Yes. I'm going to do something very confronting for you. Please. Can you stand up and turn around and then say that to the audience? Okay. <laughs> exactly what you were saying to us. Okay. So they all can hear you, because this is okay. the emotion I want to trigger in you. Okay. Um, we've been working through quite a lot of uh, issues and uh, exploring and exposing beliefs and uh, there was a time when we, we were working through something and there was a lot of emotional charge and um, we were both being quite expressive and I'm usually quite reserved but um, it was productive but all of a sudden I felt an emotion inside me and there was a, it, had, it felt organic and I could more, more or less <coughs> see it as a, as a tube like this and it stopped me dead. I wouldn't say it, it wasn't blissful, it wasn't extremely distressing, it was just there, very powerful. And what I wanted to ask Kundalini was, while I was in this, just for those seconds, I, I don't think I felt as alive as that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. When we came back to still feeling free, but continuing, the contrast between the aliveness there and that was really remarkable. And I would have I thought afterwards, why didn't that continue? I, I felt it would have been wonderful if I'd just gone straight into, further into that. And that's what I wanted to ask about. So why didn't that feeling continue? That feeling of just being yes. alive? Well, not, not necessarily that. There was obviously something deep and powerful there. Mm -hmm. and, and something seemed to not let me progress into it. Mm -hmm. That's what I Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
you can sit down there. <laughs> so I fully understand the question, actually. That's um, it. What, what's, what was you, happening is that yeah. you, you had that experience where you're experiencing the emotion for that for that for that few seconds. Yes. But then oftentimes there's another there's other capping emotions that that get triggered when we're fully experiencing an emotion. Right. This often happens when uh, well even things like during sex and things like that where mm -hmm. where you'll be open emotionally to one feeling and then it will trigger this other feeling like a lack of trust or a lack of you know or hatred with men or something like that gets triggered through that process and the key is to then allow that to happen instantly afterwards but often what we do is we shut down that instant afterwards <coughs> so so what and we may need and then another occasion to do it so that <coughs> what you need to allow yourself to do in the end and what you will allow yourself to do in the end is that you'll be these emotions will just be coming out of you and passing through you constantly and you won't be checking them you won't be actually analyzing them yeah. You'll just be feeling every single one, and you won't worry if you go from a blissful emotion into this terrible grief and back into a blissful emotion in the cycle of a half an hour. That won't worry you. At the moment it worries you because you think you're nuts doing it, right? Many times. Yeah. But, but in the future it won't worry you at all. You will just allow those cycles to occur, any emotion come up as it flows. And The key when you're fully choosing is you'll actually get to a stage where all of these emotions just pass through you constantly and in a day, you, you go through different really happy emotions and then really sad emotions and then, you know, angry emotions. And then, like in a day, you, you cycle and everyone around you is saying, what's wrong with that person? No, they're not normal anymore. And you're right. You're not going to be normal anymore, right? Do you want to be normal anymore? Don't you want to just be real? And, and that feeling you described of feeling alive, if you can stay in these emotions fairly consistently, you will feel very alive most of your time, most of the time. Yeah. I've found myself that it's only when I've shut down those emotions I get back down into that suppressed state that I now no longer feel connected with, even with myself anymore. So it's a relief for me to just yeah. feel whatever I'm feeling, whether it's happy, sad, crying, joy, yeah. angry, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't aware of anything that took me out of it again. But there would have been something. There would have been something. Yeah. Can, can, is there anything helpful? Is it like intentions or...? Well, the first thing, yeah, first thing is obviously say, well, right at that moment I was avoiding something. Yeah. What was it? Okay. Or that at moment I had a fear pop up. What was that? Yeah. And ask yourself just what, what was the, what were you afraid of in that instance? Yeah. And usually you can access the underlying emotion <coughs> rapidly again if you do that. You'll be, many of you will be very tempted, right, when you start this process. You'll start it, you'll feel quite enthused, you start it, and then within a week, you're thinking, wow, this is just totally overwhelming me. I can't handle this. And you'll want to shut it down. And I suppose the soul work should come with a warning. It's almost impossible to shut down once you start it. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And the reason why is because your soul loves feeling. <laughs> And after a while, you start, you start enjoying that feeling process. You'll find you process a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's also not something you do and get a certificate at the end of it either. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it becomes a way of life. It becomes a way of learning to be... It becomes freedom in the end. Yeah. It's truly what it becomes. I'm afraid to do what you feel like when you need to do it. And be loving in the same process of doing it. And it, just, and it also it does feel quite vulnerable a lot of the time though too, but the vulnerability is strength and people don't understand that yet. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time people don't want to go into an emotion because they feel vulnerable, but when you get into it and understand by being expressing how you want to be and trying to find your own self, who you truly are, not who you're supposed to be, that vulnerability of being yourself is such a strength. It's a real strength. And it's freedom. Mm -hmm. That same thing. You answer that way better than I could have thought, right? So, uh, yeah. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. AJ, uh, Cornelius was just mentioning um, spirits that have gone around and they're still angry. Da, da, da. Yeah. We had a lady that came around to our place, um, we only ran a couple of years, um, and she did some performance play on the house. Yeah. Um, it was probably four months ago. Yeah. Um, probably three months ago, there were some interesting things going on in our bedroom, not us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that was interesting too. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some things happening. So, and she um, remarkably came around to our place and said, Look, how's it been going? I said, Why well, did she mention that? There's some things going on up in our room that we mentioned. So she went and she rang me back 
and um, I said, look, I've got someone else to help you because I thought there was something going on. And she said, um, you've, you've had a, a couple of low points over the last couple of months, you know, you've been a bit upset about something. You've been over to the creek that runs past and you've picked up a, um, an entity. And this entity doesn't like you. Um, it doesn't like them, but it's attached itself to you. And you have you found you've had a lot of anger coming out? And unexplained, I said, well, yeah, damn yeah, right. <coughs> um, this entity, um, is that something that can happen? And, and can we get rid of it or something? Uh, <laughs> first thing is, yes, this happens all the time. Oh, right. um, the reason why it happens is because of the law of attraction, though. There is an emotion in you that you're unaware of regarding anger with women. And this spirit is a woman who's angry with men. And your, angry, your anger with women causes her to feel like she is, um, uh, you know, she feels offended of your anger with women. Right? Uh, and so she feels it's unjust, and so she wants to be angry in return back to you. And so it's a law of attraction event. And it's there to help you access the underlying emotion. So once you deal with your underlying emotion of being angry with women, that you're probably not even aware of that you're having at the moment, right? What, ha what will happen is she will automatically detach from you and uh, maybe she'll work through her emotion or maybe she'll find another man she can be angry with. with. <laughs> One of those two things will happen. And, but this, uh, this spirit attraction is happening all the time. Many people are not aware that they've got 10, 15, 20 spirits attracted to them at any one time for all sorts of different emotional reasons within them. The key is to look at everything from an emotional soul perspective. And so if I'm attracting angry women, then it's probably because I've got some anger with women as well inside of myself that I have deeply suppressed. Right? Or it could be because I'm, I feel powerless as a man and an angry woman uh, feels like she can manipulate me or control me easily uh, and so that could be the attraction. The key is to allow that attraction to trigger the emotion inside of yourself. Yeah. But you didn't? Oh. No, just uh, ask this man. How do I get rid of, how do we get rid of bad spirits we don't want hanging around us? I've, I've had a bad spirit hanging around me for over 30 years. Yep. I know it's always there, but I can't get rid of it. And one of the reasons why I came here was to, to see you, because you know, God works in amazing ways, and I believe that there's a reason for everything in life. Yep. And we're meant to make cross paths with certain people for certain reasons. Certainly. I need to know, while I'm here today, how to get rid of this bad energy that I've had for such a long time. Yep. It won't leave me alone because I don't know how to get rid of it. Yep. I've been trying and fighting. Yep. I've fought on my life. Yep. And I'm still fighting. The, the key is to not, um, to not fight the process so much. Imagine, so here's your soul, right? Your soul has different emotions in it. Those emotions are attracting spirits in the spirit world to you. You follow me? And the spirit in the spirit world has emotions in them as well. And the two sets of emotions cause a mutual attraction. Now, the key then is to ask yourself, well, what, what kinds of things does this spirit do with you? So if you allow yourself... He makes you depressed. He makes you... Depressed. Depressed? And angry. All right. Depressed and angry. Now... Depression is a cover for anger, and anger is a cover for even deeper emotions, right? Great. Grief. Now, what's happening with this spirit is this spirit is in an angry state themselves. And what he's doing is he's connecting with your unhealed anger <coughs> and your unhealed grief, and, and then motivating you through that feeling to do things, or to say things, or to, to act in certain ways with different yeah. people. Once you deal with this underlying causal emotion of grief, that will mean that you're no longer angry and that you're no longer depressed. And what will happen is that spirit will either deal with his as well, or he will leave you. How do I deal with that first though? This one? Or this one? That one. The bottom one. The bottom one, grief. At the moment, you're not allowing yourself to actually get into sadness. So you do a lot of, you're in a depressed state or in an angry state, 
but you're not allowing yourself to get into core grief about your childhood, things that happened when you were, when you were small. <coughs> and there's a, shut, there's a strong shutdown that you have towards your childhood emotions. Yes. And that shutdown is what's creating the anger. Right? So if you, allow, if you just flip that over and you start saying to yourself, I'm allowed to be crying, I'm allowed to feel my grief, what will happen is as you release your grief, your childhood grief, the anger will disappear automatically and depression will disappear automatically as well. But as a result, this spirit will actually start feeling less attracted to you. And so he will have less influence over you. And in fact, he'll get to a point where he'll just leave you. And I'll never have him again. And you'll never have him again. Now, now the truth is that we can expel that spirit from you. The truth is that we can expel the spirit but the problem with expelling the spirit from you or getting the spirit out of your, what, what people call your aura or your connection with your spirit body. So the problem, the problem with getting, getting this spirit expelled from you is that that leaves you open with these emotions for other spirits that you don't know coming and attacking you in a similar way. Right? So it's far better for you to have a spirit you know that's been with you for 30 years than it is for a spirit, spirit for three or four or five spirits you don't know. All right? so, so in the first century I said, it's far, quite often if it, they'd, expect, they'd expect me to expel a spirit and what would often happen is that if you ex expelled the spirit, seven other spirits would come along and cause a lot more damage to the person because they hadn't dealt with their emotion. I'm still stuck with seven other spirits. <coughs> no, no, you've only, you've only got one. Oh, okay. One main fellow. He's a, he's a man. And he has a very, very strong feeling of grief within him too. But he covers that over with his anger. And what, what's connecting is your anger and his anger are, are about the same things. You follow me? So though he has the same kind of anger you have and it's about the same kind of childhood events that you've experienced. And if you allow yourself to go into the grief about it, he will also probably go into his grief about it, but even if he doesn't, he will probably go somewhere else. So I need to go deep within my soul, back to when I was very young, yep. to relieve this problem. Yes, that's correct. To solve this problem. That's right. And when you do that, it'll be solved permanently. Permanently. <laughs> never never, you'll never be able to have another spirit attached to you like that again. <coughs> But if, if you just get rid of the spirit by using techniques of throwing things at him and throwing energy at him or all those kind of things, what will happen is he, he might go, but another spirit will come along. Okay. I feel like I've been, I've been held back for a long time. Held back for a lot of things I'm enjoying mine. Yeah, yeah. Some of the things I, 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 will, I will share in this room is that um, I'm not allowing the heck Yeah, and you, you fought those things really well because you actually had a spirit attached to you wanting you to do those things as well. Perhaps. All, all through that, I'm saying Perhaps. you do have. Yeah. Perhaps. I, I, I think I did a lot of those things because I didn't know how to deal with underlying problems that I had. So yeah. I would say to alcohol and drugs. That's right. To try and uh, lock those emotions out. That's right. But in the end, I knew that I was wrong and it was doing me more harm than good. Yeah. So the key now is for you to go into that grief, into that childhood grief. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I will talk to you about that later, if we can. Um, well, it's sometimes difficult for me to talk with each person who wants to talk with me, but yeah, we'll see how that goes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, so you're still going through your emotional process, um, but your soul has already been through that once before, right? Um, no, this is the first time I've gone through the emotional process. For Corny, it's the second time, but it's actually the first time for me. So, yeah. oh, when... Well, I didn't go through the emotional process in the first century. That's right. Yeah, but when you were in the spirit world and you went through the spheres... Yeah, so I didn't you, go through you, it then either. So you just automatically were on the second, 22nd level? No, no. The emotional process 
uh, is about two, there's two facets. There's the releasing of error-based emotions, which happens until the seventh sphere of your progression. Then on the eighth sphere of your progression onwards, now all you're doing is simulating truth-based emotions. So the error-based emotion process only happens up until the seventh sphere. So I, I didn't go through, and it, and it was all, for me in the first century, it was all about assimilating new truths. For me now, it's about getting rid of the errors as well as the truths. Yeah. So for me, this is a very new process for me, um, but, but not for others of the 14. They've been through it once before. Does that make sense? No? Is that, that didn't make sense. Sort of, Tell you what yeah. you're feeling. But um, I'm just like, if you, like, you're still working through your stuff, right? Yep. So you're saying what you went through in the first century was the stuff from the seventh level and above? What I went through in the first century was um, at the time of my birth, I was in the sixth sphere. <coughs> and all I had to do is work through truths in the seventh sphere. Yep. And then I became at one with God. I didn't have lots and lots of really hard emotions to process. Yeah. Although I had a lot of negative events happen to me at different times, I didn't have a lot of hard emotions to process. Now, I've got all of those events to process through these new emotions, which are through the reincarnation process. And that document that I mentioned earlier, Reincarnation and Divine Love, will explain all of that if you want to read that document. It's a long document, though. It's 100 pages long. Yeah. So, are you able to work through up to the 22nd sphere here on Earth? Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, everyone is. You are. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask, why do we have to have so many lives? What is, what is the... Oh, we don't have so many lives. We only have one. What, but, what, but what I'm saying is, why do we have to have... have we're the same spirit or soul yeah. all the time, but yeah. why do we have to go through several bodies? We don't. Is, is it a journey of a cycle so that we learn to become stronger souls for whatever reason? No. Yeah, what did I say? We don't. We don't have to. <coughs> there are people in the 22nd sphere of the spirit world who have only... They've never, they've never come back here again. They've only been here once. No. In fact, in fact there is, there, like I said in the original presentation, up until 1960 there was nobody who was reincarnated. If you can imagine the second sphere is even more beautiful than anything here on earth. Sure. So imagine getting up to the 20 second, why the hell would you want to come back? <laughs> <laughs> and particularly if you could progress all through that without coming back anyway, why would you want to come back? There's only one reason. Isn't there? So it's not about clearing away karma or any of those things that people continually teach. Right? The truth is you have one life. You are one soul with one life. I've just had one life. It started 2,000 years ago. My first conscious recollection was when I was, well, before I was born in the first century. And from up until now, I have all of these different recollections of my one life. So you've been through several different bodies to this body now? No. I've only been, I've had one body in the first century and one body now. The same body? No. No, different bodies because I incarnated again. I've only had, had two bodies. So all your experiences from that first century to now has been in the spirit world? All of them have been in the spirit world. Yep. I have nev never returned to earth in the last 2,000 years. <coughs> right? Ever. So you know how people say, oh, we come back and we come back and yes. we come back again? Yes. Well, it's all not true. That's what I'm, going to, <laughs> that's what I'm telling you. I understand that. It, it is possible to come back. But the discussion about reincarnation is probably a different discussion that we need to spend more time on. But it is possible to come back, but only once you reach the 22nd sphere condition. And the first time we reached that was, um, I was aware of it in 1945, on Earth time, that, that, that it would be possible to come back for the first time. Before then, I believed that I couldn't come back. Evolving, yeah, if you... Growing and, you know, you're, you're moving, you're moving out of one sphere into another and in a sense you're actually reincarnating in a sense, you know, like, I don't know. Well, if you look at the definition of incarnation, 
It's where the soul goes into a material body and a spirit body that's been created by its parents. So if you look at reincarnation, the definition that, I'll, that I'm using, it's where the soul again goes into a body that's been created, physical body and a spirit body being created by a group of parents, by, by two parents. That's reincarnation. So, so the truth is there is no reincarnation in the spirit world, but you do go through this transformative process in the spirit world where when you go from one sphere to the next, it appears to people looking at you that you change. And, and your body, in fact, dis seems to disappear. But what's actually happening is that you're moving up a, sp uh, up a sphere in love, which is actually vibrational in energy as well. So you're at a different energy vibration, and that causes people to look at you, and they can't see you the same anymore. And, uh, and because of that reason, a lot of people then think the person is reincarnated even, perhaps. And that happens a lot in the first sphere, where people, when they disappear from the first sphere to the second, all of their friends that they were with in the first sphere think, oh, they must have gone back to Earth. But in fact, they've gone to the second sphere. The first sphere spirits can't just go into the second sphere. It has to be right through their progress. And the second, any of the higher ones can come back down if they choose. <coughs> I was going to ask someone who has an answer. Good. Good we're talking about the, the vibrational level as you go through the spheres. Yep. Is is that the same? It's the same sort of feeling that we're getting now when as we progress. Yes. On this yes. You you will feel as you release certain emotions and you get into new condition of love and where you're reflecting more and more powerful love from yourself to others, you will feel quite different different as you progress. So as you progress on the divine love path, you will feel very very different in each step that you work your way through. So, for instance, um, many of you have yet to make a transition into truth. And what I mean by that is where you are truthful 100% of the time with every single person you meet, with every single emotion that you've got inside of you. Right. So you'd admit that you're not there quite yet, right? Okay. Now, that transition is like, once you, once you enter that state, that new state, you will feel totally different than you had did moments before. Now, it requires you dealing with lots of different emotions to enter that state. So the emotion of wanting to please others, you know, that gets dealt with. And then the emotion of wanting to, you know, get something from others by modifying how you feel, that gets dealt with. And as you deal with quite a few of those different emotions, you'll get to a point where you're in truth 100% of the time with 100% of the people and, you're, and you let your emotions flow. Now, you can get into that state pretty much 100% of the time, no matter what sphere you're in. But it requires you having this specific realizations about truth and how important truth is. Now, once you get to that realization, you will feel so totally different that you'll know, even in the spirit world, you've got a new place there too. You will feel that inside of yourself. Right? And in fact, right at the moment, you are creating a home for yourself in the spirit world as well as here, by just your condition changing. Right? So, so as your condition changes, new home, your home changes in the spirit world as well. Right? And that's a reflection of the changes you are making inside of your soul. And all of the garbage that's getting released and the changes that are happening inside of you. sort of been locked down, it's about love, all that stuff, and um, just got to a stage of realising this wasn't who I used to be, it's got so um, lost, it's sort of, I just disappeared from who I used to be, and even when my girlfriend's asked my mate, what's, why is he so, why isn't, you know, what's wrong with him? <coughs> and um, just lost all compassion, I suppose, or want to love or anything, and even come to a point of wondering, just even asking myself, when somebody mentioned that to me, how much has sort of gone down, like, um, asking myself, well, how would I feel if my mum and dad died? And I just thought, oh, well. and I thought, that just, like, struck me out with my answer. I was just shocked by that. I thought, oh. 
and just get, things just kept on getting worse and worse and worse and I had to do something just come to a meltdown really because I wasn't choosing to do with it so you end up getting into such a amount of pain that you know you just got to do something in the end but you don't have to go down that road if you don't want to is that what you mean or how like not feeling not knowing how yeah. you feel I'm interested um, in words, words. Yeah. Like if you're in that situation, it probably help. The lady was telling me when you've given out a sheet too of feelings at some stage. Just every day, even just um, have a diary and just just go through your day at the end of the day and ask yourself, how did I feel during the day? What feelings come up? So you just start identifying, okay, I had feelings. Ooh, didn't know I had feelings. You start noticing a little bit more. And it's starting to become a bit more like self-aware, I suppose, of what's going on inside yourself rather than what's going on outside yourself. I was totally stuck down myself. Like, I, I didn't even know what I would feel about anything at one point in my life. So it's possible to get out of a numb state and into a feeling state, but it requires a lot of desire to do that. Is that like when um, we know we felt something and start crying or whatever. Yep. And there's, there's, we just don't have a name for what it is we're experiencing. Yeah, and we don't, and we don't need to have a name either. I don't care. Just when stuff comes up, just let it happen. I don't even know what it's about. Just, just whatever happens, happens. Don't judge it. Don't even worry about it. Don't care about it. Just let it happen. Also, also with, um, I was going to say with something else too. So experienced a couple of weeks ago and <coughs> felt something coming up so I went to go and sit with it and just a little dribble came out of my eye and that was about it and I thought that was pretty crap as I walked off and <laughs> <laughs> but in that moment I realised I was judging myself and also pulled myself up on that like being self-aware once again what I was doing I was judging myself for actually you know, nothing come up but then I realised hey you did a good job because you actually took off in that moment you felt that and that you didn't used to do that just walked off when I'm working and just went and sort of sat with that and I'd never do that before so I thought well done to me I realised what I actually had done. Hey Joe, when you incarnated in the first century, what caused you to go straight to the sixth finger? Um, I can't at the moment definitively answer that question because of my own memories. Um, but the feeling that I have at the moment is that um, there's a process that, you, that every person goes through in the spirit world when you arrive in the spirit world. And when you arrive, all of the injuries that are attributable to other people other than you are generally um, healed from your body. So while they're not healed out of your soul, they're healed in your body. And, and you go through a process of many emotions doing that. So if you're emotionally open, you're, you go through this process. And I feel that that's probably the process that happened. But I still, I still have yet to process some memories about that because it's about my identity and some things that I, some things that I don't want to realise about my relationship with God. Um, so I'm still working through those issues, so I can't really answer that question completely. Why allow the, um, the creation of perfection to be subject to an imperfection that snowballs to negativity on a mass scale that then is compounded further to global suffering? <coughs> Why not just create that perfection as wrong for the overall harm in the universe? Well, the tr truth is that God did create the perfection. What I actually happened to know is there was a gift given to us, which was the gift of free will. And that gift of free will means that we're allowed to make choices that are in disharmony with perfection. And, but as soon as we begin to make choices disharmonious with perfection, we are going to pay the penalty, if you like, or the consequence of choosing imperfection. So we are allowed, God has given you this beautiful gift where you're allowed to do anything you want, including choose something that's imperfect and once you understand the gift of free will you understand how powerful that gift is you would never want that taken away from you so when once you get into a state where you're free of your own suffering you realize that this gift of free will is such a powerful gift and beautiful gift that you never knew why you can why you criticized it before then do you know what i mean it's just because we're in a state of suffering we often criticize that gift of free will 
and we, and we feel that God shouldn't have given us that gift. But the truth is that God created everything perfect, but gave us too this gift of free will, which is a beautiful gift that we can then choose to use how we wish. So how, how was the, the, the negativity created in the first instance if we were creating perfection? The uh, there's a lot of people who misunderstand what perfection is. Um, perfection is that we, we were created everything, everything was created perfectly and we we're in a perfect, pristine condition. But that doesn't mean that we had the, um, in a, the inability to choose something different to that. And the choice, the, the choice that we made as a human race, or the first human couple made, was to actually <laughs> rebel against that perfection. They wanted to actually become gods themselves. And as a result of that, uh, they chose imperfection. And as a result of that choice, we got uh, the pain and suffering. And once we understand that there's a relationship between pain and suffering and our choice of imperfection, then we start understanding how to create perfection again. And, and once we see that, we realise that we can actually get into back into this pristine state ourselves, with God's help of course, but you can do it yourself just by making different choices. And that's really part of the learning lessons that God has made for us to learn in this nursery of the soul. So we, this universe we're in now is the nursery of the soul. And there are, there are other universes you will experience in your progression where you've learnt those lessons of free will and you're now using your free will constantly in harmony with love rather than in, in disharmony with love. So, so the truth is that, that God created a perfect universe with perfect laws but gave us this gift where we were allowed to, if we chose to, do whatever we wanted, including break the law. Right? So you're allowed to break the law, but there will be a consequence for breaking the law. Now, the only way, for, if God didn't make it that way, then God would have made us robots. All right? so, so a lot of times we're, we're forgetting this gift of free will and how powerful it is and how beautiful it is. The truth is, if, if God created a perfect universe that couldn't be muddied up a bit by your choices, right, then what would happen is that God would then create you as a robot without free will, and we wouldn't even be having this conversation right at the moment. Yeah. Right? And, and the truth is, this gift of free will is one of the most beautiful gifts that you will ever experience in your, in your life. And when you bring it into harmony with divine love, when you bring it into harmony with God's truth, you'll find that there's, the whole universe is open up to you that were never open to you before. So you'll start to understand that this gift of free will is a gift and not a curse. At the moment, a lot of people feel it's a curse. Yeah. Yeah. How can we uh, make a choice based on uh, affection if we're coming from an error state? Inside? Good question. Did everyone get that? How can we make a choice coming that's about perfection when we're coming from an error state? Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question. The, remember, the way I draw it is that we've got our soul and we've got what kind of influences? Truth influences and error, error influences, right? And error influences affect our all emotions, desires, what else? Our intentions and everything, right? Now, the question is, <laughs> if this error is inside of me, how do I then know what the truth is? Well, you know by the pain you're in. Right? Because it, error always is painful and always creates suffering. Right? So, so... If there's pain or suffering anywhere in me, in my physical body, in my emotional state, in my relationships with any single person that comes into my life, and if there's pain and suffering involved with any of those, I am in error. And I need to just come to terms with that, that I'm in error in that condition. And if I allow myself to see the truth of that, that the error always creates pain and suffering, then I can actually make some different choices, emotionally different choices. 
So obviously the first thing to understand is this soul is attracting the pain and suffering because of the emotions in it. Release those emotions and it will no longer attract those same events. And so the key then is to go through this process emotionally, not here, but, but here. So there is a way you can recognize truth even when you're in error. And let's face it, for most of us, we know when we're doing things wrong, even as we're doing them many times, don't we? <laughs> like, you know when you're yelling at your kids that uh, it's not so much fun for them, don't you? You know that. But there's just this emotion at the time driving you, isn't there, a lot of times? I've, I've just got to yell at them, I can't help myself. And that emotion that's driving you needs to come out. And you can see the damage that's happening to your own children if you're doing that many times. But we don't address it emotionally. We don't look at ourselves emotionally, and that's where the big problem is for many of us. We've been taught to think everything and not feel anything. What about all those behaviours that we have based on our errors that we do not recognise? Remember when you met me, mm -hmm. you pointed out all these things that I didn't have a clue about? Yep. And I was so angry with you for pointing them out because it's I beg your pardon, that's not me. But I now realise, of course, yes. Well, the truth is that, that anger is really good. Because anger is telling me, as soon as, if, any, if anything in the universe gets pointed out to you and you get angry, you know straight away there's an error inside of your emotion. Right? <laughs> so it's really, really good. Anger is really good. It tells you things, right? This is, anger is a painful emotion, isn't it, to experience? When you feel it, it just all your body tightens up, everything becomes very stressful. It's a painful emotion and it's telling you a lot. No, I think you need to recognize that anger. You said, Hell, but your anger reason is that no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, where do those people go from there? I'm not, you know, having like. Well, the, the truth out. is that nobody can progress with generally without somebody helping them. Yeah, and, and this is something that you come to realize in the spirit world a lot too that a lot of people in the spirit world realize that after a while that they can't actually process unless or progress unless they rely on something, unless they trust someone. Right? Now, God has the ability to help us, but most of the time we're not connecting with God. So rely on other people who seem to be connecting with God to see what they're telling you and what the law of attraction is bringing you and you know, let yourself see those events. Yeah. But the truth is, for all of us, we will all have to rely on someone at some point. To help us in our progression. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is so as spirits attached to it, to it kind of back there, yep. we need to do the same with with our relationships with other people. It's the same. It's exactly the same dynamic. Yeah, every relationship you enter, whether it's a spirit relationship or an earth-based relationship, it's all based about the law of attraction. So it's all based about what in what 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 positive soul qualities do I have? What positive soul qualities they have? What emotional injuries do I have? What emotional injuries do they have that causes any attraction? And it's the sum total of all of that that causes the attraction. Yeah. And it's, that's immaterial, whether we're spirits or people on earth. It doesn't make any difference. How far do I have to hide my emotions, my pride, or my husband? Please. You don't hide them at all. Because I am told, don't cry in his presence, don't show him your emotions, your pain. I want to know... You cry in his presence as much as you want. Yeah. 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 It's very important that we express our emotions in the situation we are in right at that moment. Truthfully. Truthfully. So, you know, whatever attractions are going on, deal with them. Talk to the people you're attracted to, even. Like, find out why inside of yourself you feel a certain way. It's all about that, right? It's all about feeling things inside of yourself and finding out. If you're, if, if you're with a partner like that, and you're being forced <coughs> into control your emotions, you are being forced into shut down your, shutting down yourself. And that's it's shutting painful. down yourself. It's painful, very painful. 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 You need to just let yourself cry. So, so, like, if everybody did that, we'd all be releasing our emotions as soon as they happened, wouldn't we? And if we're releasing them as soon as they happened, would we have, be storing them? We, we wouldn't even have this problem we've got now, would we? 
because we'd have released everything. Is that what they're doing, like, in, in the Middle East when there's a funeral? You know, women are wailing. Yeah. That's, that's what's happening. It's really good process because they're not just wailing about the death of their child. They're wailing about all sorts of emotional injuries that are just coming out of them and coming out of them. And the funeral is the only time they're allowed to. That's why it's all coming out then. They're allowed to then. But if all of us were allowed to feel all of our emotions all the time, like... If we burst out crying, if I burst out crying, I know I probably will cry today in front of you, based on some of the things I'll be saying later. And like, like at the end, what's wrong with that? Yeah, but see, we think there's lots of things wrong with it, don't we? Like, if you see a really angry person punching a bag and yelling and screaming and swearing and everything, what do you feel? Right. So, what do we want to do then? We want to shut them down, don't we? We want to stop them. We want to control them. We want to put them in a prison or we want to put them in a psychiatric ward or something to control them and shut them down, right? So they don't get into our... So that we don't feel our own emotions in the end. That's all it's about. Yeah. So, you know, you hear the term judgment a lot, right? Mm -hmm. True judgment is when you, through your own emotions, decide to try to shut down another person. So, so, like, I'll start expressing some emotions later, and you will start feeling like, oh, Jesus shouldn't have those emotions. <laughs> and then what, what are you doing right at that moment? Judging. Judging. Why? Because you have beliefs about who I am, and you have, you know, all sorts of things going on inside of yourself, which will cause you to want to project at me, shut down emotions, or doubt, or whatever. Does that make sense? The key is to stop doing all that. Own all of your feelings. Yeah? Can I finish the question? My husband has a feeling he's a burden to me. Yep. And it is very, he's in hospital, and he said today to me he will rather be in hospital as coming home to be a burden. Yep. How do you feel, really? Do you feel uh, he's a burden? Uh, no, one side's no. I yeah, but see, you're not being truthful there. Other side's it is too much to care. Exactly. That's the feeling you have. Yeah. Your feeling you have is it's too hard for me at my age and my own physical ability to care for my husband at home. You feel that. He feels that from you. Talk about that with him. Let yourself feel that emotion. You're allowed to feel like it's too much. You, you know, it is exhausting caring for somebody, particularly when you, you know, you're trying to care for him and care for day-to-day -day life as well. It's very, very difficult. I talk about it. Yeah. I told him that I am in stress and he should understand me. <laughs> I'm not telling him or showing that because I want to hurt him. It was because I am in depression and in stress, but I deeply love him yeah. and I will stay with him. Yeah. And I try to give it to him to understand. Yeah. But somewhere is something between. Yeah, and the key is to discuss these things openly because it will trigger your emotions and it will trigger his emotions. And it's okay, even though he's in hospital, to trigger his emotions. It's okay if he's in the hospital bed having a cry. Yeah. Probably uh, actually in fact, it's very good for him. Yeah. So he has been, he has been the final severing for over 12 months. Yeah. Well, Katerina has been fine for 12 months yeah. by him and over him. Yeah. And he has closed down completely yeah. um, because... Well, and this is this is why I say you must do what is important for you first emotionally. Then you deal with the others, whoever the other person is. But firstly, do what is important for you emotionally. You follow so, me? He's had to cope for 12 months at home with Catalina crying, 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 and he's having a situation. Uh, where's, you know, what, what do you do to help? Him. Does he have to keep suffering because he can see that he's a burden and she's crying and he's paralysed and he can't talk and he's shut down his emotions so he won't, he won't talk anymore? Well, uh, his choice to shut months. down his own emotions, is a long time. but that's his choice to shut down his own emotions. Mm -hmm. His emotions are being shut down because of guilt and other, other feelings within him. And he's allowed to make that choice. Mm -hmm. um, the tr for Katerina, what she needs to do is make the choice that's in harmony with love for herself as well as him. <coughs> you can't just love the other person and not love yourself. So if you're crying every day because you're feeling overwhelmed about caring for someone, you need to change the circumstances so you're not caring for them every day. Right? 
He's I started in to be much more stronger. It's very I, good. I feel a big healing process to you at BBDs. Thank good. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as you deal with that, Katerina, what will happen is you'll become stronger feeling within yourself. Now he's going to get triggered with some of his emotions. And one of the emotions being triggered in him that he doesn't want to feel is a feeling of rejection. Uh, he doesn't want to feel rejected by you. But, but it's actually related to his childhood with his mother and lots of other situations that he doesn't want to deal with, right? So if we stay in truth, what will happen is everyone around us will be triggered with their emotions, no matter what. Over the last year, because you've been crying every day but not acting, you weren't in truth then. Do you follow me? When, you, when, when, when you're caring for him, crying about it every day, you're not in truth at that moment. You're not wanting to do something that you felt bad about doing and you weren't in truth at that moment. Now you're in more truth. Now he's in hospital, you've, you've got some space now to deal with yourself and deal with your, your emotions and you're feeling better within yourself, aren't you? So you, you are now in more truth. Okay, and <coughs> grow stronger and stronger. Yeah, and more truth and more love creates less suffering for you. I decide to go this path and yeah, it's a lot of pleasure. AJ, how do you cope with, you know, how, how should we cope with um, people projecting their emotions onto us? Does that mean that, um, we've got, like, I'll just give you an example, like, people have a living with me at the moment, they think that AJ's a cult and that they don't like... Yeah, I'm a great cult leader. <laughs> 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 They are projecting that at you because of something you feel within yourself, for a start. So you have doubts about what I'm saying, about whether I'm Jesus or not, and those kind of things, right? Which they are just reflecting back at you anyway, that you need to let yourself feel. If you make a choice to just feel all of your own emotions, no matter what is projected at you, then what will happen is that you will feel in that instance. So when somebody says to you, oh, AJ's just a cult leader, there's a feeling inside of you where you think that might be true. There's a feeling of mistrust. There's a feeling of, you know, can I really trust this guy? You know, what's he going to do down the track? Those feelings are, are there inside. It's just we don't want to acknowledge them, right? The key is to then go into them Acknowledge they exist because I, my law of attraction has just shown me that I do feel it. Right? And then go into those emotions and let yourself feel about that completely. Let yourself go into the feeling of feeling like that you can't trust a male or that you can't trust me specifically if that's what the feeling is. And go into that feeling, let yourself feel that feeling. It, it, I've been thinking there's a feeling of judgment, there's a feeling of judging where I'm at. Well, there's, there's another emotion that's attracted it for you, and that is when people judge you, you are very tempted to try and conciliatory, be conciliatory to them. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. So for, this happens for many of us, right? We, when somebody judges us, we have a tendency to try to change our behaviour mm -hmm. to suit what they, to make it easier on them, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of standing firm for truth, whatever the truth is within our heart. So that is another emotion that's getting triggered in that interaction. If you allow yourself to ask yourself, well, why am I having people stay in my home who are judging me? And you will be able to see that you actually have other reasons why you're having them stay in your home, but you're actually allowing them to harm you through their judgments by having them stay. Because, you know, they help you in other ways. And so there's this trade-off going. You're almost paying a price. The price is, I've got to put up with your judgment and I'll get something in return now. Do you know what I mean? And, and what's being triggered for you is this emotion of how much, how much am I going to sort of prostitute myself, it really is, in a way, to, to get what I need. How much am I going to allow people to damage me to get what I need? And uh, you'll find when you don't compromise these issues of truth, ironically what happens is that you get what you need without compromise. But it's only after you've learnt that lesson emotionally. Yeah. So if that triggers anger for you, which it does, yep. um, and I sit there and think, well, I'm not going to win if I uh, try and argue back. So I'm just going to sit here and pop a sweat and we'll be over in a few minutes and then I'll just get up and walk out. Well,
let's go into the anger. So let's go in the anger, go out the punching bag, right? They go, fuck it, What are they doing to me? They are, what are they really doing to me? They're judging me, but let's go into that. Let's go into the anger of that. How do you feel when you get judged? Go into the anger of that. Unworthy. Well, firstly, we feel defensive and angry, don't we? Yeah. Right. So let's get into the A. You get into the rage. Really get into that rage. Right? And once we step underneath the rage, what we'll find is that underneath the, ju the feeling of being judged is some terrible feelings about ourselves that are triggering, perhaps. Or a feeling that I'm not allowed to do what I want. I feel like they don't, they don't know who I am. Like exactly. Exactly. So the feeling of they don't see me will come up straight after you let the anger come up. And then you've got to ask yourself the question, do I want to live with people who don't see me? Does any of you want to live with a person who doesn't see you? Like, is it nice? So why are you still living with them then? Can you see that, that, can you see that straight away I'm making decisions See, oftentimes we still continue to make decisions in disharmony with love of self, right? So we live with a person who's unloving to us and we stay there. Why do we do that? Because of other reasons, isn't it, generally? So deal with those other emotions, release those emotions, and you won't want to stay there anymore. You'll, you'll feel it's wrong to stay there. And you may, you may say to them, look, I love you, too, I love you so much, but I, we're going to be apart for a while. Until you work out that how you're treating me is unloving. So sometimes we don't want to make that decision. A lot, a lot of times dealing with our emotions are quite simple like that. We, we keep on going in a terrible situation, painful situation, terrible situation. We keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. In the end, we just don't want to make a decision to leave it. So we must have some really big addiction inside of myself. Does that make sense? I must have a huge addiction inside of myself if I don't want to leave a situation that's painful. Because I'm not that sure of my own truth. Um, um, so get sure of your own yes, truth. Yeah. Right. And the only way you do that is by yeah. feeling your feelings. Yeah. Yep. So you know, allow yourself to understand because what's if going I was, on. If I was sure of it, then that wouldn't, what other people were saying wouldn't bother me. No, but see, a lot of people use the excuse of, oh, that doesn't bother me, so they stay in it anyway, saying they don't. The truth is that if you're getting judged all the time, at some level, it's, you're not being loving for, of, of yourself staying there. Yeah. So, so why? You know, go deeper into that, rather than justify your actions. You know, you can say, oh, but I might lose my home. Yes, you might. Oh, but I might lose my family. Yes, you might. The truth is that when you want to really connect with God, there are many things you may lose initially. right? But you'll gain back heaps and heaps later on as you work through these emotions. You will. It's just that we don't trust that at the moment, do we, sometimes? Yeah. I'm having trouble stopping judgment purely on myself, not at other people. Yep. And I'm sure it's about so I can harm myself. Yep. I have trouble getting off it. Yep. <laughs> I've been there, girl. I've been there. And the only thing that helped me was actually working through the emotions that are, were about the judgment of myself. And most of those emotions were about, you know, feeling ashamed of myself, feeling guilty about things that have happened in the past, things like that. So allow yourself to experience those emotions. Don't go and hit yourself like I often did. Um, so I, I forgot the stage of self-punishment where I'd punch myself in the face as hard as I could with my fist. Um, so I've been there in that place and it's a really terrible place to be. Um, but allow yourself to experience what's underneath that. So, so judgment of yourself is just as bad as judgment of another. In fact, in some cases, it's probably worse. Because it's, you, you, you're treating yourself just as badly as you're treating another person, mm -hmm. if you're judging them. And it's also very damaging to your emotional experience. Because while you judge yourself, <coughs> you won't feel your emotion, the underlying emotion. Let yourself go to the underlying emotion, which is always grief about a deeper issue, usually a lot of self-shame. 
let yourself go there to the self shame issue. Yeah. And without hurting yourself. How did you do that? I mean, I'm going through that right now for the last couple of weeks. Yep. Just self judgment and it's getting worse and worse. Yep. How did you, did you snap out of it? What did you actually, what was the technique? Or <laughs> is there anything that you found to get the process started to, to, to go deeper or to, to do something? I had to come to an emotional realization that every time I judged myself, I just doubled up my emotional processing. Okay, I've come to the intellectual realization of I had to do it emotionally, okay, yeah. So. so I had to actually feel about that. Do it, feel about how much I wanted to punish myself. So what I had to do is go through the feelings that I had of wanting to punish myself. So I forced myself to not punish myself, but actually go through the emotion of how much I wanted to really feel how much I wanted to. And, what, and underneath that was all this terrible self-shame. Just terrible feelings about myself. I can already see all that. Yeah. So let yourself feel how much you want to harm yourself. Without harming yourself. Do I need assistance? Or did you well, do it by yourself? Well, I've, yeah, I did it by myself, but... In the end, you don't need assistance okay. for, to, do, to process an emotion, but Would it be more beneficial? well, you f there's a feeling in you that you're going to need it. So it's up to you, though. Mm -hmm. But there is a feeling in you that you're going to need that. Why? Why I think I keep mine just going around and around because it keeps me stuck in um, feeling dumb, no good, and hopeless. But you know what I found underneath all of this was it was a really big rage with other people that I wouldn't let myself feel. Right? So what I was doing was I was internalizing all of this anger and rage and resentment, back turning it all back in on myself. When underneath all of that there was this emotion that actually, no, lots of other people have hurt me in my life. And I wasn't letting myself feel the rage of that hurt. So instead of allowing, my, my, one of my biggest denials throughout this life has been anger. Um, I wasn't allowing myself to experience my own anger. And instead of allowing myself to experience the anger and rage, what I would do is I would punish myself. I would actually hit myself and hurt myself. Right? So what, I, what I've had to try to learn to do, and this is why I got the boxing bag and the baseball bat and a few other things like that, is and a shed. And a shed, yeah. I, I beat up my shed the other day. So. Um, um, but the reason why I've done that is because I needed to connect to these rage feelings to stop actually internalising the rage. Do you follow me? Yeah. So that my, my feelings of wanting to shut down my rage was so strong that I would, I would not... I would, in, I would internalize it and actually direct it at myself. So there's a lot of things getting damaged around my house at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adrian, um, you mentioned some um, crucifixion uh, video titles, and I didn't get them last time. Crucifixion video titles? Oh, only probably the passion. Yeah. Um. AJ, um, uh, since I started this emotional process, I've increasingly been sadder and angrier and not stuck. Yeah. Getting sadder, angrier, to more terrible emotions inside. Who's feeling that? <coughs> yeah, pretty much everyone. It's a. Un it is a good state. Well, see, what's, what's been happening is you've suppressed all of those emotions for so long. How are they going to come out? They're only going to come out by you experiencing them, right? So what often happens when we first start this emotional processing work is we go through this period where we're, we're just feeling overwhelmed with one negative emotion after the other, after the other, after the other. The key is to allow it as much as you possibly can allow it. Because it will pass if you keep allowing it and keep digging deeper into the emotion. So, um, because I've been in it for several months, I've been up saying, 
Yeah. Are you all right? Yeah. Yes, are you all right? They want you out of it. Yes, and, and I said, I'm fine, I'm fine, and then I'll just keep going. But I, I started to wonder, because I didn't have any joy in the And the emotion that you need to allow yourself to feel is this deep rage of frustration. Right? That's the emotion that you were skipping over. Right? So, so you're trying to access an underlying emotion when the top level emotion is there ready to go and you don't want that particular one to be experienced. Does that make sense? So let yourself experience that one and within a few minutes you'll probably get to the underlying one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's yeah. Sorry. Um, for me, a lot of the physical stuff like boxing, bag punches, and whacking things it doesn't work for me. I've tried and I keep on hurting myself. So it's not effective. But what I've noticed lately is it needs to be voiced, like really come out. It needs to be screamed, yelled, whatever comes out, and just go nuts with that. When it, just when it comes up, it needs to happen. Because a lot of the, it's not so much this stuff, but the, the first century stuff, everything was suppressed. You weren't allowed to say anything. You had to shut up. You just had to cop it the way it was, sort of thing. And you know, it's all suppressed, the voice is suppressed, everything you wanted to say or feel was suppressed. So I feel for me now, that's avenue starting to work for me, just to let, to let it out in your voice. It just it's almost sets off a switch, like straight up, frankly, sets off a switch. Thanks. It sets it off, <laughs> just goes off. Um, just gets you into some, just a really deep spot that you can't seem to access any other way. That's for me, because everybody's different, so you yeah. find different ways that work for you and other ways of fun. Let's practice. Yeah. <laughs> like really feeling some rage type feeling and expressing it with your voice. <laughs> Lots of you are laughing. You're not in it yet. Let's do it again. Let's get into it this time. No laughing. You connect with some anger now and just let it out. Like really voice it. Scream or yell. Scream or yell. Do it again. Ready? <laughs> 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 